watching the Aussie BIM Guru. Today I've got a Dynamo tutorial for you. Um, now this actually comes from a request that I thought was recent, but I went and checked my requests on YouTube and it's from about a year ago. Oops. Um, but I'd like to thank Tito uh, for his patience <laughs> because hopefully he solved it by now, but if he didn't then here it is. And I know a lot of you want to want to learn how to find the nearest grid intersection to an element in Revit. Now we're going to be using Dynamo, but we're going to have to think about what the location of an element really is. I mean, is it the middle of the element? Is it the bottom of the element? Uh, say a beam, for example, what's its location? The center at the end? Well, some things are easy, like a chair, for example, has a point. But sometimes things like walls might have a curve. So in this case, we're going to assume everything is represented by its absolute center, and we're going to find the nearest grid to that. But you might need to think a little bit harder, potentially. Anyway, I'm actually going to be using Revit 2021 today, which means I'll be using Dynamo 2.6. Um, so it's probably going to work in other versions, but just in case, um, there it is. And I'm also using my custom package, uh, Crumple, in order to obtain the element centroids of an element. But there is a similar node you can use in Clockwork as well. Anyway, let's dive in. Okay, um, so let's get started. Now, this workflow sort of assumes that your grids are typically going to cross each other um, in a typical view. If you have grids that don't actually cross each other, in this case, those grid intersections won't be extracted because we're going to be dealing with the curves of the grids, so the underlying geometry of them. So I'm just going to jump into Dynamo and I'm going to make a new script. So in this case, I'm just going to first of all just save. So in case we crash, um, we're all good. I'm just going to call this demo script because um, we are dealing with geometry and geometry can be a little bit heavy sometimes. So we're going to begin by getting the category by name node and we're going to call on the category of grids. From that, I'm going to get all elements of category. So we're going to get all the grids in our Revit model. But at the moment, these are just elements. They're not geometry. We need them to be curves or lines that are curves, essentially. So we're going to use the grid.curve node. And this will give us geometry. Now, in this case, we can see that the grids are essentially the extents. Um, so we can see here that these do cross each other. So we're going to be able to build intersections from every single grid running one way to the rest. What we also need is one grid to tell Revit what the dominant grid direction is. So when we have grids in Revit, typically usually running left to right or that sort of direction, we'll have letters and running the other way, we'll have numbers. So we need to tell Revit which one of these is actually going to be our dominant grid. So we're going to select at least one grid. I'm going to use a select model elements node. And in Revit, I'm going to go and pick at least just one grid and I'm going to pick A. And from this, we can then get this grid's curve as well. So now we've just isolated one grid to compare to the rest. So what we're going to do with this grid is we're going to get its direction. So we're going to get the line.direction node. And from this curve, we're going to get its direction as a vector. And now we're going to go and check if this is parallel to any of the other grids. And we're going to filter them into two sets. So from our other grids, we're going to get their direction as well. And we're going to get a vector is parallel node to see if these vectors are parallel. So we're going to compare every grid to the dominant vector. So in this case, we'll get some falses and some trues. Now note that if any of your grids are ever so slightly not parallel to each other, this workflow won't work. My recommendation to solve this problem if you have a tolerant range you're trying to compare to is to find the angle between the y-axis and your dominant vector and the y-axis and the rest of your vectors and then round down or actually divide, round and multiply to, to round it to a threshold. So maybe you're going to go to every five degrees. So divide by five, apply around, and then times by five, and then run an equals function instead. Note in that case, another challenge you're going to face is that some grids might be drawn in opposite directions by accident if they're not copied. And in this case, the vectors are going to be reversed. So you might also need to take 180 from this as well, and then take the absolute value. So a little bit complicated, um, but in that case, 
there would be some ways you could process these grids with a bit more tolerance. At the moment, all my grids are perfect because I modeled them, of course. <laughs> that sounds terrible. Um, but uh, in this case, I know my grids are all parallel to each other. Um, I try not to use it to be arrogant. That sounded a bit weird. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, um, I'm going to get the name of all the grids as well. So from my elements, I'm going to get their name. In this case, this is going to be like the A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. And now I have these in the same order as my grids. Remember, they're not going to necessarily be in order of whether they're parallel, because what I'm going to do with this is filter my grids by this condition. I'm going to say, if they are parallel, then I want, in this case, to filter, first of all, my grid curves. And I'm going to get two lists. One of my lists is going to be the grids that are parallel, and one's going to be my list that aren't parallel. So I filter them into two sets. But I'm also going to want to filter my names so that I have a list of names and a list of curves broken into two sets in the exact same data pattern. I can continue with this data now to find out which grids intersect with each other. So I'm going to go to geometry.intersect. I might need to do the actual dot. And I'm actually going to intersect each grid on every other grid. So I'm going to take my parallel set, which in this case are going to be my alpha grids, and I'm going to clash them against my numerical grids, which run the other way. Because I know my alpha grids should never hit each other. They're all running parallel, so technically they would never hit each other. Now at the moment, all I'm doing is clashing one grid against the rest. I actually need to cross-produce this outcome. So I'm going to right-click lacing, and I'm going to cross-produce. And what this will give me is every single grid in one list will be run against every single grid in the other. So essentially we're going to build up all 56 intersections between those grids. And I'm going to flatten that output. Because it's in a little bit of a messy list structure at the moment. But what this technically represents is every single intersection between the grids as a point. And I'm also going to have to go and concatenate my grid name to e names to each other. So I'm going to put on the front of each numerical grid, I'm going to put the alpha grid. And these are going to occur essentially in the same order because they're sort of being intersected in, a, in, in the terms of text intersections and then line intersections. It's, it's an interesting little workflow. Um, and I'm going to cross produce that outcome as well. And I'm also going to have to flatten that as well. And what we should get is essentially those grid references based on the intersections because we're intersecting the text and the grids in the same order. So now we know which points we're dealing with. And we also know what the reference is at those two grids. So at this point, we now need to go and actually obtain the location for all the elements. So I'm going to use an all elements in active view. Now this is a pretty dirty node to use. You wouldn't usually want to use it um, because most of the time projects have a lot of elements, like we're talking thousands. I'm using a basic sample project. Um, in this case, just my remake of the Autodesk basic sample project. So we're not going to want to use this on say a hospital. In that case, you're probably going to want to do it based on a view with less elements in it or go category by category or just find a way to limit the number of elements you're dealing with, because we're going to be doing some pretty heavy geometric exercises here. Anyway, I'm going to use the element.centroid node. Actually, it's the element centroid node from my custom package, um, in this case called Crumple. Now, the reason I'm using this node is because you can go inside it and see what it's doing. So you can always go edit custom node, and we can see we're taking the bounding box, we're taking the minimum and the maximum point, adding them together, flipping them into pairs, and then we're taking the average of each of those points. So we know the average X, Y, and Z point, and then we use that to construct a point. So it's more efficient because we don't have to assess the cube that the bounding box represents. Because that's another way you can do it. You can do element to cuboid, and then you can do a solid centroid. But it's more inefficient because you have to create a cuboid. So we're dealing with numbers instead. Much more direct. I'd like to thank um, the author of Clockwork, um, Andreas Dickman, for sort of giving me some of the ideas that I used to put this node together. He's got a bounding box properties node, um, but in this case, I just didn't want to use a bounding box. I wanted to embed it within a function directly to an element. Um, I find it's easier to understand. Now, the problem with these points is that they're not going to be flat because we're comparing to grids and grids are essentially planes. They're not really lines. So we want to bring our grid intersections and our element points to the same common plane. So a really easy way to do this when you're dealing with points 
is to take the x value and the y value of the points, feed them into a new point, and just leave z as zero, which essentially pulls all the points down to zero whilst keeping their location consistent. So I'm gonna do dot x point. Now the reason I'm doing that is because the auto populate in Dynamo for these functions can be pretty crap sometimes, I'll be honest. If I do pt dot, look, it just replaces it with key not found exception, like, you know, bugger off. <laughs> I just wanna do my own little function. So I'm gonna do y pt dot. Oh, it still did it. See, look how aggressive it is. Come on, guys. That's not friendly. Anyway, now I've got it. So I'm going to feed my points in, and I'm going to extract their x and their y value, and then I'm going to reconstruct the point by coordinates. Now, you can actually just do by x, z. I might just do that. But you could do x, y, z and just not populate z. But there we go. And you may need to up your geometry scaling under settings to extra large in this case, just to make Dynamo comfortable with what it's doing. Now, I'm going to turn off the preview for Element Centroid. And now they're all flat at the same common plane. And our grids in this case are going to be at that plane as well. If they weren't, you could always do the exact same workflow for those intersecting points. So you could always just copy this, take your intersection points, and now you have absolute confidence that everything's sitting at the same plane. So what you could do is go back and just turn off some of the previews. Clean this up a bit. Actually, I don't need to turn off, off that. And you could always turn off the grid curves if you wanted. Um, if you just wanted to see the points, I like to leave the grid curves on so you can actually see where the grids are being detected in the model. I find that's much easier to understand the two environments together. Um, but once you've got these, we're essentially going to go and check the distance of every point from every grid intersection. So it's a pretty heavy geometric exercise. So make sure you save because sometimes on big models, this will crash. So we're going to go geometry distance two. Now we're going to use a little bit of list lacing. We're going to say for every point, so at level one, we're gonna compare it against the list of points, so at level two, because our points here, we're gonna work at level two, the whole list. But here, we're gonna work at level one, each item in the list. And essentially, if we apply our longest lacing to do every single possible outcome, we're gonna get the distance from every point or every centroid to every grid intersection. So in this case, you can see we've generated more than 20,000 distances quite a lot so and this is a small project remember so you've got to be careful and what we're going to do is we're going to use a pretty inefficient method as well we're going to do sort index by value so in this case we're going to convert all the elements into indices and then we're going to sort them at the same time based on their minimum value so we're going to sort each list at level two and we're going to get the index of where that item was and remember that we're dealing with the points of the grids which we have the names for further back. So these are actually the indices of each point as they occur. So in this case, we want to take the first item of each list because this is going to be the index of the grid name that is closest. Again, at level two. And now we have the index of the grid reference. So from here, it's actually a really straightforward exercise. We're just going to, in this case, do get item at index. And from our list of grid names, we're going to retrieve that corresponding index. And there we go. We now have the nearest grid intersection to each element. Um, so pretty exciting. Now remember that this location is the centroid. So some elements that may not be the most logical location, for example, a wall. The centroid may not represent the location too well. So you may sometimes want to deal with walls with say their start point and their end point. So you might want to build a different script or a different part of the script to process those types of elements. It's really up to you um, how you represent your elements. But for things like, say, piles, structural foundations, their center is their center. And I know that's a really common use for grid references, doing like a center of a pile. Um, so it should work well for most of them. Now, you, you, you're going to need a parameter that can store this data as well. So in this case, I've went to Manage Project Parameters. And I've added a parameter. Now, I'll just add a new one. I'm just going to add a project parameter. You should probably use a shared parameter, but I'm just going to call this grid intersection with uppercase. Uh, in this case, it's already applying itself on an instance basis to groups, but if I change it to text, I can make it vary by group instance, which is really important because remember, you're going to have groups around your model and they're going to be in different locations. So you want those to be different values sometimes. I'm going to activate all categories and I'm going to go down just to some common subcategories because unfortunately in Revit it doesn't by default turn on um, the nested categories, which is, you know, really stupid to be honest. They, they should really fix that. Um, you know, someone chuck it on the wish list, I guess, and see if they care. 
Um, we'll just add a few things on here. Just some really common architectural categories that I know are probably being used in this model. So structural connections. There should be like a select everything, like absolutely everything button, not just to select what I can see. Silly, silly. All right, I don't know, we're not really using vibration management, but that should pretty much select all the typical elements we're dealing with. Um, so at this point, now every element that really matters should have this parameter available. So in this case, we should now have this grid intersection value. So let's take this value and set it as a parameter. So we're gonna use the set parameter, my name node. And I'm gonna go probably to manual mode at this point, just so I don't constantly set this parameter value. So I'm gonna take my elements, I'm gonna get the value, and I'm just gonna write out the name of the parameter, grid intersection. It's another thing I don't like in Dynamo for Revit 2021. Why do code blocks start at one? Programmers always start at zero. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, don't know if anyone else finds that annoying. I know um, John Pearson does. So at least I know one person's on my side. All right, so at this point, if we run, it should go and set the value. Now, there might be some elements that can't house that parameter. So like, for example, topography, I believe, is one element that can't. So you might get a few nulls hiding in there. I'm just trying to find one element that's triggered a null. There we go, 200, 243, what's that element? 243 is a model curve. So a model curve can't host a project parameter. So that element won't be able to do it. Now that's probably actually a room separation line, I believe, um, which can't host it. So in this case, um, you won't get everything, but you will get most things. So let's have a look at this shelf, for example. Where's my grid intersection parameter? There it is, and B3, where's B3? 3B, perfect, it worked. Let's just check a few just to make sure the list lacing was good. I'll grab this bed, B6, B6, excellent. Looking good, let's go to another level just to make sure the vertical component worked. Let's take this stair. In this case, see the stair didn't actually pick it up. If I get the flight, it didn't pick it up either. So some elements don't get picked up by this workflow, unfortunately, which is a little bit of a shame, um, but I guess that's some limitations in Revit. Let's grab my tap at my washing machine. The grid intersection is, ah, I ran this on an all elements in active view mode and I was in a floor plan. Huh, of course, that makes sense. So I only got the things I could see in my floor plan. I'm just gonna close this, run again, and it should pick up everything now. So I digress. Another reason why all elements in active view can be a little bit risky. Okay, so you can see it's taking a little bit longer because it's got more elements to deal with, but now we should hopefully be able to see those extra elements. B6. B6, uh, let's go back to that stair. C6, C6. So cool, um, it's a very robust little script. You can take it into most projects without too much configuration. And nearest grids on elements in Dynamo in Revit. So hopefully that was useful um, and might give a way for people to populate the grid references for elements in their projects. Now, as you noticed, it's pretty heavy. Um, Dynamo is not that great at processing geometry. So I'm probably gonna follow this up um, in my next video with a demonstration of using Rhino inside instead. Because Grasshopper, when it comes to dealing with closest points, it's such a linear workflow. And you'll see a much faster, much more direct way to do this. Um, but if you don't have access to Rhino or Grasshopper, there you go, there's an option for you. But to be honest, I nearly always use Rhino inside for this. Anyway, if you're not already following and subscribing, feel free to do so. And I look forward to seeing you in future videos. Thanks, take care, bye.